welcome to another edition of Flea Market Fantasy, the world's second greatest Bronze Age era comic book podcast. Joining me as always is new Mike L, Kevin Jank. I'm here and I am the law. That's very much you are the <laughs> law. And uh yeah, why don't you tell the kids what we're reading tonight, Jank? Uh today we're gonna be reading Judge Dread number two, uh the Eel Comics comic uh from nineteen eighty three. Uh, I guess this was not near the beginning of Judge Dredd's career after all, but, you know, <laughs> whatever. It's yeah, mid, I knew nothing, kind of Judge Dredd. I knew nothing of Judge Dredd before this experience. Um, why did you pick Judge Dredd? I've actually wanted to do this for a long time, but then the Guardians rabbit hole kind of came up where I wanted to tie into the movie, and that just led to all those things. But I've wanted to do this for a while because – uh, I mean, I've seen both of the movies. I don't remember much about the Stallone one other than it's terrible. But <laughs> the Carl Urban one is fantastic. So I really? have a soft spot in my heart for Judge Dredd because of that. Yeah, I love it. It's it's really good. It was one of the few movies that, like, the 3D experience actually was worthwhile. <laughs> like, it actually felt like it was good that it was in 3D. Because there was, like, this uh, drug that they were doing called Slow Mo. Where like everything would get in real slow motion and shit. Wow. And so like they they had Lena Headey from Game of Thrones, like she was in the bathtub, like just dripping bubbles and shit, and like it was all in slow mo and three D and, and it looked really cool. <laughs> it was yeah, a good experience. I, I never saw either movie. I know Stallone's that came out in like ninety five, I believe. And uh that yeah. other who'd you say was in the other one? Uh Carl Urban, who is Fucking amazing and everything. He does not get enough credit. For I don't know who he is. is. Remind me who he is. Uh, I guess you would mostly know him from the boys. Uh, you know he's home. Uh, uh, not Homelander, but the uh, what's his Bob name? The, the main Bill the Butcher. Boys Bill? leader. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Butcher. Yeah. Is it Bill the Butcher? Uh, Bob I don't the butcher? think so. <laughs> Just Butcher. Bill the Butcher is. Uh, oh, that, that <laughs> gangs in New York. Yeah. That yep. That's exactly. it. There's just Butcher. All right. Yeah, yeah, I think he's got the first name, but I can't remember it. But yeah, he uh, was that. He was also in the new Star Trek movies. He played Bones McCoy. Um, I believe he was the executioner in uh, Thor Ragnarok. Oh, all right. But yeah, he's great. He's in a lot of things, and he's always good. All right, yeah. Uh, so yeah, those are the Dread Dread films. The comic book. Now, you said this is Eagle Comics. That was uh, a short-lived uh, publisher from 1983 to 1986. What they did was they reprinted comic stories from the UK's 2000 AD magazine for distribution in North America. And uh-huh. 2000 AD is where Judge Dredd first appeared. So they just took those yes. uh, British uh, stories and packaged them for the United and uh, North America. And that that is how Judge Dredd came to the United States through Eagle Comics. And then uh, he and took this off. This is a weird there. place to start because I guess this is like a kind of like a side mission in Judge Dredd's history where he's normally in like this mega city one. Yes. Where on this one, he's in this lunar you know city on the moon. Yeah, uh, so I was very confused like a, by that. A weird place to start the story if you're going to give this to America. <laughs> yeah, cause when I was reading the uh, the info on him, you know, on the Wikipedia's and whatnot, and I was like, wait, it, it takes place in New York. I could have sworn it took place on the moon. We were reading about the moon, <laughs> but uh, yeah, yep, yeah. So let's. I guess uh, this talk- is like a temporary assignment where he got sent to you know kind of be the marshal for the moon for six months or so. So uh-huh. this is during that period. It's a good game. Because normally it's it's like Mega City 1, I believe, is the main place he's in, which, uh, like, it's it's set in the future, like a dystopian future where, you know, there's nukes or whatever, and a lot of the Earth is uninhabitable. So what they've done is, like, in the inhabitable parts, they essentially made entire towns into skyscrapers, so they just build straight up. So basically, like, the entire city is, like, one giant skyscraper, um, and they just kind of, you know, use the lack of land to go upwards, essentially. And uh, it's really cool the way they did it in the Carl Urban movie because, like, he just is in there and he's working floor to floor trying to get to the bad guys on the top floor. And uh, it's pretty great. Kind of like Die Hard. All right. There you go. Uh, So it was Judge Dredd was created by John Wagner and Carlos Esquera. Have you ever heard of either of those people? Um, I mean, John Wagner is the writer of this book here, so I've heard of him in that regard. (laughs) But that's the other. But uh, other than that, no. 
And that that artist, no, can't say I've ever heard of him. Yeah. Now the artist today for the book we're reading is Brian Boland, who <laughs> we're very familiar with, and we'll talk about him later on as well. But uh, so Judge Dredd, he started out his first appearance was in issue two of 2000 AD, and that was in 1977. And that 2000 AD was a weekly British anthology comic originally published by IPC Magazine. And that series is still running today. Wow, look at that. So as of May 2023, there have been 2,332 regular issues, 16 irregularly numbered issues, 72 (laughs) special issues, and 36 annuals. Holy hell. Yeah. That puts even, like, uh, Batman and Superman to shame, I think. <laughs> it's quite a run. Yeah, you're putting yeah. it out, you know, basically every week. Weekly, yeah. Oof. So uh, Judge Dredd is the book's longest-running character, and he's, like, hugely popular over there in England. I, I had no idea it was a British creation. I had no – did you know that at all? Yeah, I, I honestly didn't know that either. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, maybe <laughs> this, we're – I'll say this comic was definitely not what I expected at all. That's exactly I, what I was like, going to say. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I don't know, Jack. Maybe we should really take a long look in the mirror, and maybe we're not the guys to be hosting a comic book podcast. <laughs> we don't even know. Well, Judge Dredd started out in England. Yeah. I mean, we're learning. We'll, we'll yeah. Get there. Yeah, we're here to learn. Uh, yeah. So uh, Judge Dredd, uh, he, he's like on postage stamps over there and stuff. You know? Oh, really? Yeah. You, yeah. So can you vote on whether you want skinny Judge Dredd or fat Judge Dredd? Yeah, I don't know. But, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing not their regular postage stamps. But, you know, didn't they do that here in the States where they had, uh, like, Spider-Man and the Hulk and stuff on stamps for yeah, a while? Yeah, sure they had Batman or Superman for sure. Yeah. I'm guessing they didn't, you know, you know, like Speedball didn't get a stamp. <laughs> Speedball. <laughs> uh, IP's publisher was a fellow named John Sanders. And uh, he thought that, hey, there's a bunch of sci-fi. This is back in the 70s or 1975. This all started. And he's like, uh, he's like, hey, uh, there's a bunch of sci-fi stuff out there. Let's, we should get a sci-fi book going. So he contacted a fellow named Pat Mills, a freelance writer and editor, and he asked him to develop the concept for this uh, science fiction comic. And Mills then brought in fellow freelancer John Wagner to develop concepts for the book. And Wagner had written a Dirty Harry-style character called One-Eyed Jack. For Valiant, and, you know, the yeah. initial Valiant, you know. Yeah, the, yeah, not the 90s one. So uh, that, that character, One-Eyed Jack, kind of served as the basis for the Judge Dredd character, although uh, Mills is the guy who came up with the name Judge Dredd because he was working on a character about a hanging judge, and yeah. he huh. he called him Judge Dredd. But he named them after a raw, not a raw, a ska reggae. I combined the two words there. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> there is a ska reggae artist named Judge Dredd. Uh, oh, but he's he spelled oh, it like Dreadlock. Yeah, he spelled it D. Uh, well, he spelled it D R E A D, right? So uh, then they said, well, we should change it to D R E D D, just so we don't get sued. I guess. <laughs> yeah. Did that. It's a classic common tradition. Changing uh, but, just enough to avoid <laughs> But the idea was for an ultra-violent lawman patrolling a future New York, and uh, these uh, judges there, this Judge Dredd, he had the power to arrest, sentence, and execute right on the spot. You know? Yeah. No trial, no nothing. If he thinks you're guilty, you're guilty. And he yeah, he sentences. And it doesn't always mean killing. Sometimes he will send people to, like, ISO cubes, I believe, and stuff like that. And he's actually, he's very, he's very by the book. Like, he's not out there just to murder people. Like, he will follow the law, you know, to the very letter. <laughs> yeah, and they, they uh, said, because they also thought uh, this uh, Wagner fella, he and uh, Mills as well, they'd done, I think it was called Action on the Battlefield or some sort of violent book, something like that. And they knew violence sold, you know. So, uh, yeah. but here they figured they could get away with anything they wanted because violence was on the side of justice, as they put it. Yeah, so, that's right. Murder these people. Now, uh, Carlos <laughs> Esquera, he was a Spanish artist who had worked with Mills previously, and he's the one who developed Judge Dredd, Judge Dredd's visual look. But get a load okay. of this. Get a load of this, though, Jack. Wagner, when he was uh, g- telling Esquire about the character, he gave him a photo of Frankenstein from Death Race 2000. <laughs> wow. Frankenstein was, of course, played by David Carradine, 
Yep. And Jank and I reviewed that movie on an episode of the LCS Hockey Radio Show a couple of years back. That movie is amazing. Now, what else is cool about that movie, Jank? Sylvester Stallone was in that. That's right. And yep. he played Machine Gun Joe. So it's that was in my... Judge Dredd. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that <laughs> weird? Great. Like the character that inspired Judge... So Stallone is in that movie acting in with David Carradine. He has no idea that 20 years later, he will star in one of the biggest bombs in box office history based on a character... <laughs> <laughs> like that Stallone Judge Dredd was terrible, right? Like it didn't make anything. Yeah, it's not good. Yeah, yeah it's got like Rob Schneider is like the wacky sidekick. Oh, that's like, right. No, <laughs> that's right. I forgot. <laughs> but that's pretty crazy. Death Race 2000 helped inspire Judge Dredd. All right. So, uh, but Mills had to rewrite Wagner's first script because uh, he thought it was deemed too violent and over the top. Like the uh, magazine publishers, they had a board of directors. They're like, nah, we can't publish this. So, uh, Mills had to redo it, and Esquera also drew the cityscapes and technology far more futuristic than they had intended. So Mills just said, you know what, we're just going to go with it. So then all Judge Dredd stories were set in the year 2099, uh, 122 years in the future from when, you know, they were being written. So over the years, that has continued. So the stories are always set 122 years in the future. So. That's it's like a sliding scale, so then yeah. it's always <laughs> yeah. Just keeps moving. Okay, that's good. Uh, so uh, it's, what was I going to say about this now? So yeah, they had to redo that first one because they wanted to launch uh, 2000 AD, the anthology book with Judge Dredd, but because of these issues, they couldn't. So then uh, Wagner quit the project, and so did Esquera because. There's something going on, like some other company offered to like buy uh, the rights to them or something. And then that deal fell through. So like Wagner got mad or something and he just left the project. So Mills freelanced it out to different writers and artists because he didn't want to lose the character. And so he decided to wait until he found the right script. And he picked a script written by a fellow named Peter Harris. And uh, the artist was a guy named Mike McMahon. No relation to Vince. <laughs> and so they're the guys who are actually – produced the first Judge Dredd story, and that story ran in issue two of 2000 AD. And then Wagner returned in issue nine. He came back and took over the writing jobs beginning with issue nine. The deal fell through. (laughs) But uh, apparently in Britain, they refer to like issues by the word prog. It's very weird. So when I was reading this, I was like, what the hell is a prog nine? Is that supposed to be short for? I have no idea. Yeah, maybe a program. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Wagner came back in issue nine and uh, Boland. Uh, well, we'll talk about him later, but I think he joined up in like uh, he started doing issue like 43, I think somewhere around there. And uh, yeah, like these issues we're reading here today, like you said, it's an odd choice. Why? Why wouldn't they just start with. Yeah, know, towards the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Like he's already up maybe those were their strong stories. They're like, yeah, maybe they're like, yeah, it took us a while to find our footing. Hey, so uh, do you know in the movies did uh, Judge Dredd? Uh, do you remember what they called their guns? Did they have a specific name for their gun that the judges oh, carried? Um, I don't remember if it had a specific name. I remember it had a lot of cool different features. Like you could just like active. It was like voice activated, and you could like change to all these different kinds of rounds, like flame rounds and you know shock yeah. rounds, and these kind of different things. But I don't remember what it's called, per se. Yeah, Yeah, the gun is called the Lawgiver. Lawgiver. I have a joke there, but I'm not going to do it. And uh, (laughs) for a family show. And like you said, the gun comes equipped with uh, six different types of ammunition. And like you mentioned, some like uh, set people on fire, like napalm rounds, some explosive rounds. One's just a normal bullet. That's the execution shot, like when they just uh, shoot you with that. Then there's one like a, a rubber bullet, like a, it's coated in rubber, okay. so they can shoot. It's cheaper. <laughs> well, they, no, apparently the way they described it in uh, the Wikipedia is he could shoot uh, behind a suspect, and because of the rubber coating, it would hit a brick wall, bounce off, and then kill the suspect coming back the other way. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, wow. Coated in rubber. That must have been the one he was using in the one story in this book. <laughs> Ricochet and, and got somebody good. Yeah, there was a ricochet shot. <laughs> um, yeah, the lawgiver. 
All right, so the background on this Judge Dredd, uh, do you remember, did they give his origin story in the movie? No, they give you basically nothing, and the great part about it is, like, Carl Urban was totally fine with not taking the helmet off at all. If this was a Spider-Man movie, he'd be taking his mask off every five seconds <laughs> for no fucking reason. But <laughs> given that this guy, he knew that the character really doesn't take his helmet off, so he didn't take his helmet off the whole movie. And also, no, <laughs> we don't no know one, anything about his backstory. And no one really knows who that guy is anyway. Let's be fair. You know, yeah. Toby, Toby Maguire's got to take the mask off, you know, but this guy doesn't have to. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, this Judge Dredd fella, he and his brother, uh, Judge Dredd's real name is Joseph. Oh, Joseph okay. Dredd. And he has a brother named Rico. Joseph and Rico. And they were, uh, they're like 12 minutes apart because they were cloned from the DNA of Judge Fargo, who was the founder of the judge system. Oh. Yeah, but like, that, yeah, you, this you may have been in the Stallone. On one. <laughs> yeah, you mentioned sounded. this is like a post-apocalyptic sort of situation. Like, uh, there's been a World War Three and things are running wild, so the judge system comes in to, like, try and control things, you know? And uh, yeah. um, So the two brothers, now, the way that they're cloned and they're, like, uh, raised up in, like, a little, uh, I don't know, uh, one of them just station tubes or whatever. Yeah, and, sure. And they come out, uh, even though they're, like, a, their bodies are, like, adult humans, their uh, brains were like, in, how did they describe it? Like five year olds, I think, when they were born. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, they, uh, they, like, they aged them up. Yeah. <laughs> so then, like, by the time they were hitting the streets as judges, they were like nine years old mentally, their brains. Uh, but even though they're fully informed teams. And when they were like being. That's what you uh, want to do is get, get people who are in charge of delivering justice. <laughs> yeah. We have the brains of nine-year-olds. <laughs> and when, when they, the when they were young, that. though, when they were being, uh, you know, in the tubes or whatever, they were pro- pre-programmed with all the things they needed to know to be a judge, though. Like all the... Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so... Get all, all the weird stuff like the ABCs. Just get to the law. <laughs> yeah. It's a weird situation. But, yeah, so his brothers... And then they find out that that judge who they were cloned from, he was supposed to be dead. But then they find out he's not dead, so their father's still around. And then uh, there's all kinds of stuff. And eventually, Rico and Joseph, uh, Joseph, uh, beloved Judge Dredd, he finds out that Rico turned bad, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it was definitely that? was in the Stallone one. Oh, I think. okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, I forget who played him. I think it was Armand Asante or something like that. No idea. Uh, so he, <laughs> so Judge Dredd, he, he arrests his brother Rico, you know? And he sentenced him to 20 years in prison. So uh, Rico goes away to prison for 20 years. He comes out and wants revenge on Judge Dredd. Oh, that's good. That's good storytelling right there. And then Judge Dredd kills him. <laughs> kills his own brother. So, yeah. There you go. That's yep. the Judge Dredd backstory. The law, yeah. man. Hey, Jake, you break the law. I'm gunning you down, just so you know. <laughs> that's the way it's going to go. Uh, that's fair. <laughs> I can't even put him in a fight. <laughs> that's fair. <laughs> I'd welcome it at this point. I don't know. <laughs> oh, no. That's not, that's not encouraging. All right, so I think that's everything I know about Judge Dredd. Is there anything you'd like to add? Uh, well, I guess there's the, I guess one of his probably bigger villains who, uh, I picked number two because he was very involved in the first issue and very involved in the third issue. So I wanted to pick a, an issue that was just kind of normal Judge Dredd stories. But I guess there's like a Judge Death. Uh, who was, I don't know, I guess he was a former judge or something who died and is now like a spirit who can kind of hop from body to body and like turn them in, turn other judges into like him, his like weird ghostly form. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I, w- I would like to read more of that, but I just kind of wanted to pick some, uh, some normal, just four Judge Dread little short stories and see, see what they're all about. Yeah, you mentioned the short stories, uh, because when we were going into this, like I said, I had no concept of Judge Dredd. I didn't know it started in Britain in a weekly thing. So I thought we'd be getting a full 22 page comic book, you know, whatever, one story. But yeah, the, because it was a weekly format over there, the stories are small, you know, they're like six pages, six to 10 pages, depending on the length. And yeah, so I, you get, you get four in this book. Now, how do you feel about four? I, usually three is the magic number, right? You get three stories. Yeah, 
I can see that. But uh, none of them really dragged on too long, so I guess I, I can't complain about it. Um, it gave well, you by the fourth one, I was, I, was uh, I took a knee there in the fourth one. I needed to regroup, <laughs> and then I came back. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I read this whole issue in stages, so, yeah. <laughs> I think three might have been a wiser choice there, but uh, they went with four. So that's what we're yeah. dealing with. All right, Jank, let's look at the cover. Why don't you describe it for the people? All right. So we got a great looking Brian Boland cover here. Um, it's, it's weird. They don't have a corner box per se. It just has an Eagle Comics Presents. It's kind of like a, you know, a little triangle with an eagle in it. Um, and then in the upper right corner, we get December number two and like a circle. Uh, dollar book. That's not too shabby. Um, then we get the Judge Dread logo. Which uh, the U is actually his, his like his badge with the eagle and it says judge in it, and then the rest of it's just kind of normal letters, but they're kind of like crumbling, kind of uh, they're jaggy kind of like, or something. I don't know yeah. how to describe it. Oh. Almost like a computer, you know, when you, you find a font for like a weird computer writing because they're kind of I, you know. I will say but. this: uh, I, currently, I'm redesigning some some book covers at this moment in time, and I'm mm-hmm. looking for a font. I would not choose this font. This is, this is not a good looking font. Yeah. It might be below Comic Sans in that regard. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to go with that. Yeah. But for this book, I think it's fine. I think it works. Yeah. Um, but then we get the, it's kind of a, it's set against a pale yellow backdrop. Not a lot of background in here, just, just a couple figures in the foreground here, and that's about it. Uh, but we have, Judge Dredd on the right side, he's looking over. He's got his big old gun. Um, and another judge who's dressed differently, he's got a, like, hammer and sickle on his uh, belt buckle and his knee pads. So clearly he's a Soviet guy. <laughs> he's uh, he, he's staring Judge Dredd down. He's got a big gun as well. And then in the middle, we got this little guy who's like an umpire. Um, and it says umpire on his vest. He's dressed. He's got, like, a catcher, you know, the baseball umpire type of uh, vest on. And he says, this is it, sports fans. When I blow the whistle, it's war. Yeah. Now, yeah. we didn't describe what Judge Dredd looks like. Uh, would you like to talk about his outfit? <laughs> uh, I'll take a stab at it. It's yeah. a very complicated guy. <laughs> uh, he's got a helmet. Um, I guess it's somewhat Magneto-like, I guess. It's like black. Um, it doesn't come down. It doesn't quite cover as much of the face as Magneto's does, but it's got a big visor across the middle. Um, it's kind of outlined with red and the red kind of goes in and kind of makes like little eye, I mean, at least in this version, kind of like tilts in to kind of underline the eye a little bit. <laughs> so, but then the bottom half of his face is exposed and uh, then he's got like a blue outfit um, with these Kind of like predating Cable with all the shoulder pads and shit. Yeah, you know what? I didn't think of that, but he does very much like Cable. Uh, yeah, yeah. He's got a big gold shoulder pad on the one arm, and the other side's a bunch of like uh, medals and kind of just weird uh, eagle shaped things. Yeah, like a giant um, eagle he's got on the... his right shoulder. And... Yeah, yeah. Some big like yellow kind of uh, pads on his elbows and green gloves. Uh, he's got a big gold uh which we call badge on his chest and says dread and he's got a green belt with a yellow like eagle belt buckle and it's got the american flag on there so you know he's you know, an american judge here <laughs> and he's got big yellow knee pads and green yeah. boots yeah there's knee pads it's like he's uh laying some carpeting you know he's <laughs> a carpet installer good dread <laughs> yeah yeah, they're pretty padded. That's kind of ridiculously padded. It's yeah. like two times thicker than his actual leg. <laughs> but I like this cover. Uh, it's simple, but it's striking, and uh, uh, I dig it. And uh, you notice uh, Boland signed his name there on the inside of the cape of the other judge, and he he puts the yeah. N backwards. I guess that was his gimmick, you know? Oh, because it's on the Soviet guy. <laughs> <laughs> they always put their letters back. What do you the end backwards there? Um, yeah, we'll talk about the creators later, but this is very early Brian Boland, of course. Yeah, I, I still thought it was very good. So then we open up the book, uh, Judge Dre. He is the law, just like Jack. Yeah. 
And uh, <laughs> this first story is called The Oxygen Board. And uh, John Wagner wrote all the stories in here. Brian Boland did all the art. Uh, Tom Frame is your letterer. And uh, John <laughs> Burns is your colorist. Hopefully that? Tom Frame of her uh, you know, title. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully that wasn't his idea. <laughs> yeah, choose a better font. <laughs> all right. So uh, <laughs> uh, the year 2000 and, uh, or 2100. Man, 2100. Hey, we're not that far off. Not that far <laughs> off. We're getting close. Yeah. Uh, e- each day, huge sure. astro oh, tankers arrive at docking bays above the domes that cover Luna 1. Their cargo, oxygen. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, so they're yeah. up on the moon. There's like a moon colony up there in a giant bubble, I guess. And uh, some some fellas are coming in, and they're trying to uh, break in here. Because they got a scheme, Jank. These nasty crooks. Yeah, they do. Well, what are they going to do? <laughs> uh, so they're going to get a hold of the oxygen system and pump in, like, some knockout gas and uh, knock everybody out so that they are then free to rob a bank. Yeah. But it, yeah. it unleashes quite the chaos down there in the old moon colony because people are wrecking their space cars, you know? And uh, <laughs> this, this one poor <laughs> sap. cereal, kind of like yeah. I was- after a couple of tequila shots, he's dead now. That guy, <laughs> that guy's dead. He drowned in his oat, in his little uh, what, what's he eating there? Uh, plasty flakes. That's what he's eating. <laughs> so that guy's you dead. You don't have that for your last meal. No, of course not. So a lot of horrible things are happening because of these creeps wanting to rob this bank, and uh, they go down there to rob it. Oh, here come the judges! All these various judges on these little yeah. flying motorcycles come in here, and uh, I think. There's there's one judge with like a cowboy hat, and then later on we see one with like a giant Mexican mm-hmm. sombrero, right? In one of the other stores. <laughs> yeah. It's almost like the moon is like the, you know, U.S. Mexican border. The way they got these judges. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Judge Dredge trying to. Sadly, there's an uh, escalator situation where uh, people are passed out on it, like a people mover yeah. kind of deal, and they're getting crushed. Hey, it's like the old joke by. Uh, you know, uh, who was that fella? Who did, Mitch Hedberg, remember? He said, uh, escalators can't break, they just become stairs. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. In this, in this situation. Yeah, it looks people, like all these people are dying, yeah. They're just yeah. getting smushed and dying. <laughs> I don't know what, what's happening. Uh, <laughs> the great thing so, is the Judge Dredd, he's got, you know, they got their oxygen mask on, he's flying around, he's got, we gotta stop this people mover. Instead of like just going over there and pressing the button to turn it off, he shoots it. Yeah, <laughs> he's like, this is much more efficient. <laughs> he's a badass, and uh, so he saves those people. And then there's a bunch of robots. A bunch of robots are there to help out, and they say, "Hey, you robots, go help out the people or whatever." And then some train derails and goes flying through the air. I don't know. Yeah. There's a lot there's happening. That guy too, yeah. <laughs> there's a lot happening here. And hey, uh, ju- this uh, picture of Judge Dredd here. Uh, the big one where he's just the whole left side of the page, you know, and mm-hmm. he's like saying, hey, the, the biggest disaster in the moon's history and the men who did it are going to get away scot free. If you that actually looks like Stallone, I think of you. <laughs> it's just kind of weird. Yeah, I was like, oh, yeah, I can totally like see Stallone. that. Yeah. yeah, it's not bad casting in theory. I think the yeah. movie was just kind of <laughs> off base, but it could have worked. Right. All right, Jake. So uh, Judge Dredd there, he can't capture the crooks. But what happens to the crooks? Yeah, they have no leads, but uh, the crooks are back at their place. Uh, they're celebrating. They got a whole, you know, table full of diamonds and jewels and shit. And uh, they're just like, all right, we're we're made now. We're just going to count up our money. But uh, they get a call from the oxygen board. Uh, they're apparently behind on their payments. So <laughs> they're getting cut off. Um, and unlike most utilities where they just kind of turn off your electricity, they actually suck the oxygen out of your place. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty great. If you're not paying for the oxygen, you're not getting oxygen. You don't get no. Yep. <laughs> and so a couple of days later, they find the crooks there in their apartment. How, how do they find them exactly? They just. Yeah, uh, because uh, I guess they were trying to get out. Yeah, obviously, it's like, oh, there's no oxygen in here. We got to get escape. Mm-hmm. But like, like, we don't have the key. Like, we must have dropped somewhere in all that loot. So they're, like, frantically trying to sort through the loot to find the key, but they can't do it, and they just die. <laughs> and uh, then the judges just show up a couple days later, and they're like, uh, well, guess we got them Trank Gas Raiders after all, Marshall. 
the <laughs> oxygen board executed them for us. <laughs> That's my, I've got a strong accent. That's my new uh, favorite part of the show, and Jank does accents and voices. Yeah. Big fan. <laughs> Not executed. Text cut off. It sure pays to keep your gas bills up to date. And then, so they got hoisted on their own petard by yeah, the oxygen. My favorite saying. And then there's a little box beneath that. A smart man can beat the law, but baby, only a fool bucks the oxygen board. And then in yeah. parentheses, old it's Luna saying. Yeah. Oh, no, <laughs> so there you go. That's the first Judge Dredd little story there. Pretty quick, you know, simple little. But uh, that that gives you an idea of what we're dealing with here. A simple little story with kind of a little twist ending there at the end. Mm-hmm. And uh, now this it's one, Judge. I one to start off on because Judge Dredd didn't really do a whole lot. Correct. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. <laughs> yeah. I would not have started with, well, I guess this is issue two, so maybe they're banking on people having experienced issue one, so it's kind of like the fifth story they're reading. But if this is the mm-hmm. first story you're reading, I, which it was for us, I'm like, oh, well, Judge Dredd, he doesn't do anything? <laughs> yeah, so, all right. <laughs> he can shoot buttons real good, yeah. but uh, <laughs> I guess. Other than that, that must have been his rubber bullet, too, I'm guessing, hitting that button. Yeah, because yeah, the bullet off. was, like, bouncing off, it seems. So. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. All right, so next time, or the next story up here, we get uh, something called the Lunar Olympics. Yeah. And uh, we see a big, uh, like, Olympic competition going on here on the in the moon there. And we see, like, the Soviet squad marching in. And uh, that lady. Very small like, Olympics because there's only two uh, nations competing, it seems like. <laughs> yeah, it's like Luna 1 and whatever else this other place is. What's the yeah, other the Soviet place? cities. Uh, Soviet <laughs> cities. Yeah, uh, clearly that lady in the front lifting that flag is she's on some sauce, you know. <laughs> she's on. Uh, yeah, that might be Andre the Giant in a wig. She's <laughs> she's juiced to the gills. All right, then. Uh, so they're going through, but that's the thing they're worried about: these athletes cheating, you know. So yeah. uh, because there's a rule, but apparently it is legal to cheat somewhat because you can be up to twenty percent yes. bionic. Twenty <laughs> percent bionic. Yeah. Just no more than that. <laughs> so sadly, I would not make the cut. And then they also scan uh, for steroids, and they can tell if you're taking steroids or stuff. And, yeah. and and they find out one of these Soviet athletes, he's nothing but bionic parts and steroids. That's like all he is. Yeah. And they're like, all right, well, this guy, this guy's a cheater. <laughs> we got to throw this guy out, you know. But that creates a big controversy. And uh, so there's already some hurt feelings here between the Soviets and Lino One. And uh, it looks like they're playing some sort of a baseball game or something. I don't know. Um, then they're doing like. Uh, uh, yeah, well, they're doing like a. Uh, first, they do the high jump. Oh, the high uh, jump. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But uh, since they're on the moon, it's, oh. you know, they're breaking records left and right, basically. That wasn't baseball baby. at all. Why did I think no. it was baseball? They're jumping <laughs> over a high bar. <laughs> and and then, uh, then they go to the shot put is next. And again, because of the low gravity, he like throws it all the way into the stands and knocks somebody out. That's, like, that's why I thought it was baseball. It looked like a home run. It looked like someone hitting a <laughs> yeah. home run. But they're throwing a shot put, and they're hitting the guy in the yeah. head. And uh, then they're like, uh, is that guy on a, a surfboard where he's going down a ramp and he's jumping into yeah, the Yeah, I forget what they call it. It's uh, a dust board. Oh, the X it's Games. Skateboard, but it doesn't have wheels, I think. <laughs> this, this is how the X Games started right here. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but, the guy, but the guy's going to miss the catch nets and he crashes down and the judges give him like bad scores. That, that's the other thing about the Judge Dredd. A lot of satirical stuff in here, you know? Yeah. Uh, like, poking fun at society and whatnot. So, and apparently like it's it's kind of like the Simpsons in that it predicted a lot of things. I was reading an article where it's like, yeah, Judge Dredd, you know, was pre- right about a lot of things. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, that's interesting. So then they're going to have a uh, like a 40 yard dash. Or I don't know how long a dash it is. But there's a fella here with, like, bionic thighs. Yeah. That's what I got. <laughs> and he's beating everybody. Because the guy, he's competing. This guy in second place, he's got, like, a bionic head. That's not really going to help you much in a race. I yeah, know. I guess it's I a know. dome, like a pointed dome, so it's more <laughs> aerodynamic. But, I mean, compared to bionic thighs, like, what were you yeah. thinking, dumbass? <laughs> I'll take the bionic thighs for the race. <laughs> you but, can get a little bit of drag off that, but, you know, great. <laughs> and the guy with the bionic thighs, he's from the Soviets or whatever, so he's about to cross the uh, tape there to win. But what happens, Jake? Uh, he just disintegrates. 
<laughs> yeah, just completely, you know, becomes a pile of dust essentially. And then the guy with the dome ends up winning. Um, and apparently it was because somebody in the crowd shot that guy, uh, with like a sniper rifle or something. Like a laser. And, uh, Judge yeah. Dredd, he, uh, he caught a flash of the, uh, laser flash from the crowd. He's like, oh, I saw a laser flash. Someone shot him. And by the, this look at Judge Dredd's helmet there. <clears throat> it's pretty awful. Look at that fucking helmet. <laughs> I don't like that helmet at all. Yeah, I don't like the, uh, the weird kind of X in, of red in the middle there. Above the nose, yeah. Yeah, that, that's a bad touch. I'm, I think they dropped that before they got to the movies for sure. And he has like two layers of like the eyes are black, and then there's like a clear plexiglass bit to the visor. That extends the sneeze guard. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. And also, the shape of the helmet's really like round. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I think I like that. a magneto shaped helmet would be cooler. You know. I mean. Yeah. I think they did end up going more that route. But, yeah, this one is very, like, bowling ball-esque. Yes, very (laughs) much so. All right, so Judge Dredd hops on his little uh, space scooter there, and he's zipping after uh, because there's two judges from the Soviet cities or whatever, and they caught a guy, and and they're going to execute him right there on the spot, you know, because they said, hey, we we saw you. We're sentencing you to death. But Judge Dredd says, hey, you can't just uh, murder that guy, you know. We don't have uh, have have death penalty here. Yeah. It's like, yeah, he can't. One, apparently. Yeah, Luna 1 is uh, progressive, you know? <laughs> so the the fellas say, hey, and then uh, Judge Rudd says, got to take that gun. He screams it, which seems weird. <laughs> I don't Yeah, <laughs> you didn't need that much force behind that. Yeah. <laughs> it's not like, I got to take a dump. Like that, I can see you screaming, but. <laughs> got to take you know. that gun. And he shoots, <laughs> and he hits the gun out of the guy's hand. Maxwell Smart did this all the time on Get Smart. He would always shoot the guns out of people's hands. It's pretty awesome. But the bullet must have been one of them rubber bullets, you know, and it oh. zips off the gun and shoots the other judge in the chest and kills him. So yeah. now we got an international incident. Yeah, that's not good. Yeah. They immediately declare war. Yeah. But, but apparently it, war yeah, in the future. Yeah, it's a very different thing. <laughs> yeah, explain what war is in 2099. Yeah, so instead of uh, the normal thing where, you know, two armies go at each other, uh, it's basically it becomes a part of the Olympics where you each side, like the U.S. Luna One people have four players and a reserve player. And the Soviets also have four players and a reserve player. And I don't know, it's kind of like running man or something like that, I guess, where it's just like these two teams are going to fight each other and try to kill each other. <laughs> <laughs> and whoever wins gets to claim some territory from the loser. Isn't it? No, I'm not a big video game guy, except when it's hockey or, you know. But uh, isn't there, what is that, like, uh, game everyone they used to play where oh, you have Fortnite? No, not Fortnite. <laughs> um, um, kind of, of like, yeah, one of them Call of Duty Special Ops or something. Weren't, weren't you able to get, like, four four-person teams and you go into, like, a, a map oh, and try yeah. to... There's a lot of games like that, yeah, yeah, yeah. and you try to hunt each other down and kill each other. That's what this is, basically, you know? Yeah. So look at that. Judge Dredd predicted that as well. Yeah. Good on you, Judge Dredd. (laughs) Uh, So the Soviet team, they've got these fancy uh, anti-blast suits. And so there's nothing the U.S. team can do to, like, even harm them. And they're in these outfits. So the Soviets are running down. They also got these laser guns that are just murdering them. So they're, they're like, oh, this is... The Soviets, they're going to run away with this. Luna One's in trouble, you know. But then Judge Dredd, he's he's always thinking, he's, what 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 plan does he come up with, Jank? <laughs> uh, well, he ends up becoming the reserve player. He wasn't supposed to be, but like the the Soviets like killed the guy I think who was supposed to be the reserve player. So he gets in there, and he's like, all right, he's he's got one player left. It's just him and this other guy. And he's like, all right, I got a secret plan to get their weapons. Cause apparently the only thing that can, that can penetrate their armor, the Soviets armor is their own weaponry. So we got to get our hands on their weapons. So we're just going to run at them, <laughs> drop our guns and just run at them. <laughs> yeah. It seems like a questionable plan, you know? Yeah. But this, this judge dread though, he's a, uh, he has an idea here, but I should mention while this, all this is going on, like you said, it's part of the, the sporting competition. So it's being broadcast on TV live. And there's like a commentator and everything, you know, it's basically a sporting event and, you know, they're covering it like a football game or whatever. And yeah, yeah. but th- this Judge Dredd, he, he realized that their fancy laser beams, 
they don't detonate on contact. They detonate on distance. Like they're programmed for a specific range. Yeah, that seems like a terrible weapon to me. Yes, <laughs> I would ever want that. <laughs> you have to constantly be recalculating distance in your mind. Like that's that's terrible. <laughs> I can only kill something at twenty five yards. Anything less. Than- yeah. So they go running right at them, and because they're within twenty five yards, the laser beams pass right through them. Which yep. seems weird. I don't know, but anyway. Yeah, I feel uh, like that's probably nuking your insides or something. Yeah. <laughs> like, send the, on a radiation later. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, Judge Dredd and the Luna One, they win, you know. And then uh, the commentator goes to get in a uh, post game interview with them. And uh, he sticks the microphone right in the guy's mouth. <laughs> he yeah. says, uh, "He says war isn't uh, you know something to be la- laughed about or you know it's not some game. Sometimes war is necessary, but don't ever let creeps like this tell you it's fun. War is pointless. War is evil. War is hell." <laughs> and that's how it ends. There's some guy on the on the recliner just be like, "Huh." <laughs> <laughs> So there it is. How, how'd you like? A lot, of, a lot of British guy commentary on the American people. I feel like in this book, <laughs> <laughs> probably about how we're just violent idiots sitting in front of the TV. <laughs> yeah, that is true. Why was it? Uh, it was based in like London instead of like yeah New York. I think they're definitely taking shots at the Americans, but <laughs> when it's entertaining, I'll give them a pass. <laughs> this is damn Brits. <laughs> All right, uh, so two stories in. What are you thinking about the Judge Dredd? You enjoying it? I'm definitely enjoying it. I'm having a great time so far. <laughs> All um, right. Yeah, I, I, these are fun. They're not, you know, overly complicated. They're just good, clean stories. All right. Next up, let the land race begin. So Judge Dredd has the honor of uh, opening up a new territory on the moon. You know. Yeah. And he fires so I guess his... they're doming off certain sections and then, you know, making them habitable. So this new one is opening up now, and it's basically just like a drag race to try to get to these places first and claim them. Yeah, and a bunch of shenanigans are going on, you know. Um, <laughs> one guy's that... flying, so they're like, oh, nope, you're out. That creep on the speed seat is a flyer. Cut him out, men. So the <laughs> judges grab him and they cut him off. But uh, it seems like creep is one of Judge Dredd's favorite words. It's also one of my yeah. favorite words. So it's <laughs> creep. Judge Dredd is your spirit animal. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, all these people, they're on all these different crazy, wacky vehicles, and they're trite, and people are dying in the race to get this land. And uh, One guy claims something, and then he dies immediately. Yeah, so all right, there's a lot of that stuff going on. Now we cut back later. Judge Dredd, he's at home, and he's got his robot. He's got a robot servant. Yeah, who talks like Barbara Walters. Yeah, <laughs> he can't pronounce R's. Except uh, sometimes apparently he can. Like There are some words where apparently it's just fine. But when it starts the word, he definitely can't. Yeah, his name is Walter, and mm-hmm. uh, he's got a, a lady robot friend um, named Wawina. I guess Rowena. Yeah. Uh, this is Wawina, the waitress, <laughs> the waitress Wabbit. Master? I don't know. I can't do this. Yes, Jake, he does you, the master. Okay. <laughs> you, 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 you do the rubbing voice, Jank. Uh, this is beyond she my She has abilities. a delightful wine to weep for. <laughs> <laughs> and the little robot lady, uh, hey, look where the cassette play. It looks like the little cassette wheels are right where her uh, boobs would be. Yeah. yeah. I was like, yeah I like that. Brian Bowen killing it. Uh, but she says, my, my mistress is widow Spock. And uh, she claimed a good Main Street site to build a flapjack parlor. But this afternoon, three men came to see her, and they, they threatened her uh, master, basically. And they said, yeah. you either sign over the property or we're going to kill you, you little lady. And so uh, she she came to Judge Dredd to ask for help. And Judge, Judge Dredd, he just flies off the handle. He yells at Walter. He's like, hey, what are you doing here? This uh, I can only take a crime report from a human, not a machine. Get this stinking robot out of here, Walter. You know? <laughs> Yeah, first. yeah, that's a weird, weird reaction. You think of nothing else, like you can't necessarily take the report. Yeah, It'd be like, okay, I'm gonna watch this old woman. So <laughs> uh, clearly, something's up. Rowena is like uh, weeping, you know, even though she's a rabbit, she's all sad. And uh, Walter's trying to console her. Now, notice uh, Rowena on her belly; she has a little sign that says "Call me Rowena," and then on his belly, Walter has a sign that says "I'm Walter. Try me." Yeah. Sounds like a threat. The robot gigolo. 
<laughs> so now we cut over to uh, Rowena's house with a lady. You know, he's getting threatened. And the and the, the fellas show back up, and they strap her to, like, this brainwashing machine. And they're going to force her to, like, sign the papers to transfer the land, you know? Mm-hmm. But uh, but this old lady's fighting to control it. She's, like, really uh, powerful, strong will, you know? And they can't get her to sign. She scratches out her signature. But then, oh, Judge Dredd shows up. Yeah. Yeah. And, Great. And his two buddies, uh, who in the Mexican sombrero. And, uh, <laughs> and the cowboy hat, yeah. I'm trying to find a look for their names. Uh, Chico. He calls one Chico. Take them hoodlins <laughs> away. And arrest their bosses at IPC. Oh, their bosses at IPC. That's the name of the publisher. Oh, look at that. A little inside joke. Yeah. Getting meta with it. I like it. So, uh, Judge Dredd saved the day. But why was he such a jerk about it with Rowena, you know? <laughs> uh, they say it was like an undercover thing. Like, he didn't want them to know, like, uh, I think basically they had to wait till they started to rough up the old woman. Otherwise, they wouldn't have anything on them. But couldn't they he have told Rowena, yeah, we'll go do an undercover sting, you know? Yeah. yeah he apparently doesn't seem to care much about robot feelings. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but Rowena, to show her uh, gratitude, she shows up at the house and she made cook. Well, she says her uh, mistress made cookies for him. But uh, uh, Judge Dredd, when he, he takes a bite of the cookie, and he's like, a human did not make a robot made these cookies. How do you think he could tell that? <laughs> Um, they weren't made with love. (laughs) (laughs) This case, cold and metallic. So he's like, why did that robot bring, make cookies just to come back to my house? And then he looks out the window of his little uh, globe shaped house. And sure enough, out in the front porch there or whatever, there's uh, Walter and Rowena sitting like uh, together, you know, like, uh, she's going to give Walter that try. (laughs) (laughs) It's like a little boyfriend and girlfriend, you know? And uh, yeah. and Walter's talking himself up pretty big, you know. Uh, he's like, of course, as Judge Dweed's robot, Walter has to be pretty woof and wetty. Some of the whisks Walter takes would curl your circ would make your circuits curl. And then she says, yeah, "Oh, you're so bizarre. brave, Walter. I hope you always be Rowena's dot 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 friend." Oh no, she friends on friend right zone. No, no. <laughs> I, I think she's just being coy there. She doesn't want to admit that she's really into Walter, you know. She yeah. she really loves Walter. That's why she brought over the but cookies. Would be. Look at how boxy he is. Yeah, guy's she rich. Went, she wanted to go see Walter again. That's why she brought the cookies. And then uh, Judge Dredd, he's like, robots and uh, robots and love, ridiculous. Still, I suppose we should have known this was coming the day we gave robots human-like personalities. Still, if it keeps water out of my hair, I'm all for it. And he's giving <laughs> a little reluctant grin there. He's smiling a little bit at that. Yeah, just the slightest hint of a smile, I would say. Hey, hey, wait a minute. Watch those robots make love. <laughs> so yeah, like, wait a minute. Look, look at that silhouette <laughs> of uh, Walter and Rowena. Where is Rowena's right hand? <laughs> uh, I think that's called tickling his butthole. <laughs> <laughs> what is going on there? <laughs> I didn't notice that on first read-through. Yeah, I don't it's... know if he has an input jack back there, but <laughs> <laughs> she's going to find it. All right. So, uh, one story to go. What's going uh, on in this one, Jake? Uh, the next one is called The Face Change Crimes. Um, and we got a bank being held up by two guys who look like Laurel and Hardy. And, uh. uh there's a third guy, too, a Charlie Chaplin. Yeah. Yep, yep. I was trying to figure out where the other guy is. But yeah, they're holding up this bank and, uh, they're shooting everything. And the judges show up and they're like, okay, this is a hostage situation. Like, come out and, you know, give us the hostages and stuff like that. So they start sending the hostages out. They're like, we're not bad guys. We're going to send all the hostages out. Don't worry about it. <laughs> and so they start sending them out. And then by the end of it, they're like, all right, well, we got this face changing machine. So we're going to give ourselves new faces. And, you know, then we're going to go out along with the other hostages and people won't know that it's actually us. So they come out as the Marx Brothers this time. They switch up their faces. And, uh, like, the judges are kind of like, there's something about those faces that look vaguely familiar, but none of them can, like, really place it because, obviously, that's a long time ago in this yeah. timeline. <laughs> um, so the judges rush in, and they find, hey, wait a minute, there's nobody here, just some hats, and that's it. 
And then they yeah. kind of start piecing things together. Oh, these guys, you know, I think they leave part of the face changing kit behind or something. So they realize, oh, they, they, they left. We're not going to get them here. But then uh, Judge Dredd, he tracks down to like the place that sells face changing uh, apparatuses, <laughs> whatever they do, face changing yeah. machines. He Apparently the face changing salon, but then they also have home kits too. It's like yeah. getting your hair dyed again. <laughs> and he's, and he's looking through their past customers and he recognizes some crooks, you know? He's like, ah, I bet these guys are the guys. So they, they bring them into the uh, the uh, police headquarters there, and they're leaning on them. You know, they put the, the light in their eyes, and they're interrogating yeah. them, and, and these guys aren't going to crack. And then their lawyer shows up. <laughs> yeah, this lawyer. Who does he look like? He looks like somebody. Oh, man, like like Sloth from the Goonies. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. He looks... It's almost like if uh, J. Jonah Jameson uh, merged with uh, uh, the guy in Babe, that Cromwell guy. <laughs> Cromwell. <laughs> That'll do, Dredd. <laughs> I don't know. So it's weird. But, uh, yeah, so he's this pretty misshapen. He's kind of like the guy from The Hills Have Eyes. Really wrote that book for. <laughs> the Hills Have Eyes, yeah. So he uh, – the judge gets, or not the judge, the, uh, the lawyer gets the crooks off, and then he's giving it to Judge Dredd, you know? He's like, you can't be leaning on my clients like that, you bum. And, uh, Judge Dredd says, yeah, I'll bet I had to read Slim for now, but two can play a dirty game, you know? So then the scene mm-hmm. cuts. And now the lawyer goes into the car with the crooks, they drive home, they're sitting around the house, they're having fun, telling stories. The crooks are telling their lawyer about how they did the job and how they got away with it, you know? And, uh, well, what happens though, Jack? A big reveal. <laughs> well, it turns out that's not their lawyer. Somebody else got smart to this face changing game. It's actually Judge Dredd with the face made to look like the lawyer. And he's been yeah. recording everything they said. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Judge Dredd. He pulls out a gun and is like, hey, you better just turn yourselves in now. And we'll get another creep. He says, now you creeps are going to get one last face change. There's a look a con gets when he's done 40 years in some repair gang. Kind of sad, kind of empty. It ain't pretty. Uh, that's how the book ends. But that's if you it. change your face, I guess it'll be pretty yeah. after all. <laughs> you can give yourself yeah. any kind of look. <laughs> Just don't take that lawyer's face. Not a good look. No. Right? Yeah, because the more I look at <laughs> Not it, like, that's he, the he, yeah, the, the last page, he looks nothing like Cromwell and J. Jonah Jameson. No, he looks like he's a boxer who's really got his yes. face pounded in. Like his yes. nose is broken a lot. <laughs> he's, he's got big ears, uh, big lips, big yeah. mouth. So, yeah, anyway, that's it. Then we get a uh, little, like, I guess this was on the back cover. Uh, yeah, maybe like a pinup or, yeah, it could have been the back cover. Judge Dredd, he's saying freeze. And there's a criminal in the front, like uh, he's covered in nitro, because I guess the nitro tank got shot. And he's yep. frozen, you know. <laughs> Liquid nitrogen. <laughs> I'm jumping up, out. Yeah. Let's read Dan Mashek's tweets. Oh, <laughs> yep. So there it is. All right, so that's Judge Dredd. That was yeah. uh All right, before we get into it, let's talk about the creators. We forgot to do that. Uh John Wagner, the writer here, he was born in Pennsylvania. Oh, in look at that. 49, yeah. He uh his parents got divorced when he was 12 and he moved to Scotland with his mom. So that's how he ended up over there. And uh, he started a writing partnership with Alan Grant in 1980. Did you ever hear of Alan Grant? Um, I mostly think of Jurassic Park <laughs> when I hear the name Alan Grant. Uh, but Okay, I, I never saw Jurassic Park either. So uh... That was Sam Neill's character's name. Oh, okay. <laughs> but I guess uh, he's a famous British uh, comic book writer as well. And uh, so they – I'm guessing Grant worked on Judge Dredd too, you know. But um, – Wagner gets credit because whoever typed up the script got the credit. That's how they worked. <laughs> like they, just, <laughs> they both did the ideas, and like and neither one liked to type, I guess. So, if, hey, you type it up, you'll get the credit. Uh, like just, those guys in the first episode of Columbo. That's what I was thinking, too, and I was watching <laughs> yeah. this. Yeah, Jack Cassidy. Yeah. 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 It. Uh, the duo wrote under pseudonyms uh, to hide how prolific they were for the IPC publisher there, because I guess they were doing everything for him. So the publisher said, all right, use different names just to keep people thinking we've got a lot of people working here, you know? Instead of, instead yeah, we've got a whole bullpen, not you just two schmucks. 
<laughs> but Wagner and Grant were part of the big British invasion, you know, with DC Comics there in the 80s. And uh, they created a 12-issue limited series called The Outcasts for DC in 1987. Did we do The Outcasts on this show? Uh, like, this would have been before I you. I know. I wasn't here, but I, I think you did. Yeah. Was that Familiar. that thing? Or no. That was a Batman kind of team. Was that the outsider like or something? I think. Out- <laughs> I think we did the outsider. Oh yeah, you're right. Yes, yeah, that's what I was thinking of. So I don't know what the outcasts are then. I was. Yeah. Hmm. Right. I don't know. If this was a better show, I would have looked that up. But uh, yeah, so. <laughs> I hope Fetish is on that team. That's all I yeah. want. Yeah, we still got to research that guy. <laughs> uh, then the uh, the duo also did about forty Batman stories for Detective Comics, starting with issue five eighty three, and that spanned from nineteen eighty eight to nineteen ninety two. Uh, Wagner is probably uh, also most famous for, in 2005, he wrote the graphic novel A History of Violence. And oh, okay. That got yeah. made into a movie with, uh, I think, David Cronenberg, right? And I think he made Larry's it. Larry's favorite, Vigo Mortensen. Vigo Mortensen, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but he obviously did a bunch of Judge Dredd, this fellow. You know, he did everything. So. Yeah. He is the Judge that's Dredd. Pretty guy. good. That's a solid legacy. Yeah. Yeah, you create Judge Dredd. That's pretty good. You know. Yeah. Still yeah. running in Britain, apparently. So yeah. yeah. So let's talk about the writing here. Uh, again, four little short stories. They all had a little uh, simple story to follow. A nice little twist ending at all of them. And uh, kind of like the Whistler. Always a little yeah. twist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very much so. <laughs> yeah, I mean they were fine. You know, I liked them. They were. Yeah. Look, yeah, I thought I, they were all pretty interesting. I guess the land claiming one was probably the weakest for me. Yes. Um, not that it was terrible by any means, but I mean, it was very short and there wasn't a whole lot going on there, but, uh, it was fine. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, I didn't love any of them. Like there's, it wasn't one where I'm like, oh, this is the best <laughs> thing ever. I, I think the, yeah. uh, the Olympic one was pretty good. I, I thought that was, I like the satirical elements of it, you know, and, yeah. uh, making fun of society and whatnot. Uh, I thought the ending could have been a little stronger, maybe. Him just yelling war is bad. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I mean, I did like him shoving the microphone down the uh, the commentator's throat. Yeah. That was pretty great. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah, the message at the end was a little much. I mean, it's kind cool. of, you know, before ending. Yeah, a little I heavy-handed. Change. You yeah. could change. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody could change. A little heavy-handed. Uh, the, the one with the bank. Yeah. The nice little twist at the end there. Yeah. The first one I liked, uh, except, uh, not a lot of judge dread in that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's accurate. I guess that's why you do four stories. That way you can throw in some weird ones like that, where it's just like, here's a rando for the hell of it. Yeah. And again, they're cranking these out, you know, one a week, you know, it's not like they, (laughs) and he's doing a bunch of other stuff too. It's not like this is the only thing he's doing. So he's just yeah, if you compare story. this to like the you know the the uh, Spider-Man comics that they would do in the newspaper, <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, those never went anywhere. <laughs> no, like, uh, so this, I mean, at least you're getting something cool every week. <laughs> here's what I here's what I remember about this Spider-Man. Like they're like three panels long, and uh, yeah. it seemed like the third panel or the first panel always recapped the third panel from the last issue. Yes, and so yep. <laughs> it's like one step forward, two steps back. You never really get anywhere. In 20 years, you got one story. This is yeah. good. So, yeah, I, I think uh, Wagner does a fine job here. And uh, not a lot to complain about. Yeah. All I right. thought it was really good. I, I mean, I, I, the only thing that really in the writing bumped me was the whole uh, the weapons in the Olympic one where it was like, oh, yeah, they don't hurt you if you're close yeah. to them. Like, <laughs> that is, that's that's weird. weird. I mean, I'm glad that Judge Dredd figured this out and exploited yeah. the flaw in the system, but that seems like an odd choice. There was also no clue that that was how they operated. Yeah, you know? true. Like, uh, there should have been some giveaway to that. Because I even went back and looked again. I'm like, wait, where does he figure this out? And there's nothing there to indicate that that's what it is. He just pulls that out of thin air. So I'm like, oh, okay. When you've got the brain of a nine-year-old, you can figure these things out. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, But again, this is not what I expected at all from Judge Dredd going into this. No, me neither. It's a lot smarter. And I thought it was just going to be like, you know, testosterone driven, like like an 80s action movie. But no, it's actually pretty solid sci-fi. Yeah, it's it's clever. 
it's uh like you said smart and it's not overly violent you know like i going in i thought it was going to be punisher basically right 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 yeah but but uh no it's really kind of like oh henry <laughs> or the whistler <laughs> more than it is punisher so it's a uh, pretty unique in that regard all right, so yeah, the artist, like we mentioned, that first story, he doesn't even really do anything. Like, yeah, yeah they're just kind of, it's not that over the top with the, you know, murdering. The, it's just kind of. The only guy he kills in uh, all the stories is by accident. The ricochet bullet. That yeah, the that's true. It's, so. Because yeah, there's no killing on the moon, apparently. No death penalty. Yeah. So. so I guess we got the, we, yeah, we should read one where he's murdering people in the streets. You know, in New York City. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Instead of Luna 1. All right, so the artist is Brian Boland. Uh, we've talked about him before on the show. Yeah, yeah I'm passing now. But I think I we think I actually so. know. No, we did. I know exactly where we talked about him in depth before. But uh, we'll recap some stuff, and then I'll reveal where we talked about him before. But uh, Brian Boland, he was born in 1951 in Lincolnshire, England, uh, because I thought we had never talked about him in depth. And then I, when I looked at his credits, I'm like, oh, there it is. That's how we talked about him. But, mm-hmm. uh, in 1972, he uh, attended a British comic convention, and that's where he met Dave Gibbons of oh, Watchmen wow. fame. And yeah. uh, they, they uh, became good oh. buddies. They hit it off, you know, and they became chums. And uh, Gibbons was instrumental in getting uh, Boland's art career started because he recommended him to join some art agency. And then that agency got him a gig. And uh, actually, his first real comic gig, he and uh, and Gibbons would alternate drawing a bi-weekly comic about an African superhero called Power Man, which was uh, <laughs> sold exclusively in Nigeria. So <laughs> that's pretty crazy. Uh, oh. But uh, he said it was the best thing for him because he learned how to be a professional comic book artist like that. He was because Ni- comic books were new to Nigeria at the time. This is a uh, mid seventies. Yeah. And, uh, so they had to keep all the stories very simple, you know, like six panel layouts, just concise storytelling. And so that's what he focused on. And he also said he learned so much by watching Gibbons because like Gibbons would do one page a day, you know, and crank it out. And he said he couldn't believe he was able to do that. So he had to really pick up his game <laughs> to like be a professional. And he learned by watching Gibbons. Uh, and he said the great thing was he could learn by doing actual professional comic book work and no one he knew would ever see it. Because it was only in Nigeria, you know, so he yeah, could make mis- yeah, it's a it perfect pl- yeah. yeah, he could make mistakes and figure it out on his own. So he said it was pretty great. Uh, so that eventually led to uh, Judge Dredd, because Gibbons went over and started working for 2000 AD, and I guess he recommended, <clears throat> you know, um, Boland uh, to get a crack. So Boland started doing covers, and he's really famous for his covers. Like that's mm-hmm. probably what he's known for these days. Uh, but back then he was also doing interiors. So he was doing covers for the magazine and then they needed someone to fill in on a uh, Judge Dredd issue 41. So he did that and that was in 1977. And then he became like the, basically the regular artist then. They just kept him on doing that. And so he did I a bunch if of- That's why they started with this Luna One era is because probably. Brian Wolf doing the art. Yeah. That's probably that is, a good reason. Yeah. I didn't even think of that. That is yeah. probably why. Yeah. Because they could mark, because yeah, they could mark it as bowling. Although this came out in '83, was he really famous? Well, you know what? Uh, no, but he here's really the credit. Talented at this point, so here's the credit that I told you I, I remembered. In 1982, he did a book called Camelot 3000. Oh yeah, <laughs> so, that I'm sure it rocketed him up the chart. <laughs> uh, if, you're, if you're new to this here podcast, if you go back in the early days, uh, probably this is probably year two, uh, maybe even year, I, I think year two of the show, uh, Mike Gale picked Camelot 3000, and it's basically King Arthur uh, set in the year 3000, and you know it's the year 3000 because they have crowbars with flashlights. <laughs> so, <Yep>. You know, <clears throat> height of future technology. So I'm sure we went in detail about Brian Boland back then, but I totally forgot he did Camelot 3000 until... I wow, yeah, I just, I just know that. I totally blocked that out of my mind. I remember <laughs> the crowbar. <laughs> so if that came out in 82, then 83 when this is being released. So, yeah, they probably thought, oh, people know Brian Boland. Let's just start with Brian Boland. All right. So uh, Elvira House of Mystery, issue one in 1986. Brian Boland drew that as well. Wish you would have done that Christmas yeah. special. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's another show favorite. Of course, he's probably most famous uh, for The Killing Joke, 1988. And mm-hmm. that was hugely influential for his visual depiction of the Joker. And it was also what inspired Tim Burton's view of Batman and the world he built in the movie. He points yeah. to that. So. Yeah. Interestingly enough. Think- Frank Miller's okay. Dark Knight Returns is definitely part of that too, but it definitely made Batman that kind of kicked the ball down the down the hill, got it rolling as far as making Batman darker. And uh, interestingly enough, this Bolin fella, he didn't like uh, the Killing Joke. He uh, wow. he hated the way it was colored because he didn't color it, and I guess he also had some issues with the story itself. So he said from that point on, he would never do interior art unless he was also writing the story. Holy hell. And coloring it, I think, is also implied there. So uh, <laughs> in 2006, he said he gave an interview and he said the work he's most proud of is a story called An Innocent Guy. And that was written for Batman Black and White, which was a 1996 Batman anthology. Yeah, he wrote and drew that and everything. So I never read that. I'm sure Mike Al has it pinned up in his bedroom. But I uh, <laughs> probably heard that. <laughs> But uh, yeah, that's I mean, why I thought the Killing Joke was very well colored. Uh, yeah, they I still remember that. that they actually in my mind. well, they re-released it years later with his mm-hmm. coloring. Oh, maybe that's what I'm saying. So, yeah, I don't know what I can't remember what year that they did that, but um, that's interesting though. Uh, yeah, yeah, he said he. He didn't like doing interior, like if he couldn't control everything. So he still had to make a living. So he just did co- covers because covers is just one page. And he said, if they fuck it up when they're coloring it, ah, who cares? Move on to the next one. <laughs> <laughs> but so he did a bunch of covers. Wow. Uh, he, like we did Animal Man a few weeks back. He did that famous cover. He did a lot of, you know, a Wonder Woman. He did a lot of I saw some Zatanna covers that were spectacular that he did. Um, oh, I would imagine. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds very nice. <laughs> he draws a good Wonder Woman, too. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, he's a very uh, good artist there, this Brian Boland. Oh, good for him. Like, being yeah. able to make a living just off doing covers. Like, that's, uh, that's great. Well, uh, I heard this before. I think we talked about this before in the show. But artists, the, the reason they like to do covers, at least back in the old days, is uh, when they would do the interiors, they wouldn't get the pages back. They would only get, like, uh, maybe oh, two sure. pages two or three pages back. But if they did the cover, they got the cover back and then they could then sell the original work. Yeah. So that, yeah. Cons. Yep. 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 That's big money maker. So there you go. Anything else about Brian Boland you'd like to mention? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think he covered it all. I think he's, he's very, very good. Even at this point, which is a little bit earlier in his career. Um, I mean, some of the faces, maybe you could say like, eh, not his finest work, but, Overall, I was very impressed, and I really like the composition of a lot of these panels, like the where he's shooting the like the uh, the gotta get that gun panel that you know didn't make sense. He was yelling <laughs> that, but like the way they frame it is really cool. Um, overall, I, I really like the artwork here. Yeah, I'm not a huge fan of uh, his style here, but because uh, he he did like super realistic faces sometimes, but then yeah, the body, especially with the, like the celebrity in the final story there. Yeah. <laughs> they yeah. do like the March Brothers and stuff. Like, but then the body would be kind of like cartoony or exaggerated. Uh, it's kind of a weird style. But uh, you, you know he reminded me of when I was reading this, especially the first story and uh, some panels like when the guy passes out into his uh, cereal and stuff. I'm like, this kind of reminds me of Robert Crumb. Uh, the way it looks. <laughs> and, I, and I was reading up his, his bio and it says he was, when he was a kid, he did read Robert Crumb a lot. So oh, okay. um, I'm like, oh, I can see some of that in the and some of the anatomy and stuff and the way he the little lines uh, to, to uh, kind of shade things. So I go, oh, all right, that's a little similar. But uh, I don't know. Yeah, I'm not a huge fan of his work here, but it's fine. You know, it's fine. Yeah, I mean, I thought it's it's definitely way above average for me. Like I would if this was most comic books, I would be fine with that. <laughs> yeah. So, all right, well, what are you giving uh, Judge Dredd, issue two? Um, let's see, I'd probably, 
like I said, I really like the art, so I'm going to give that a nine just because I know he can do better, like Killing Joke, so I can't give him a perfect ten, but oh, wow. I liked That's it a lot, so I'll give it a nine for the art. And the stories, I would probably go a seven, so I guess average out to an eight. Like, I thought overall this was very impressive, um, a lot better than I expected, and if I had the time, I would love to read more Judge Dredd, actually, after reading this. I will go seven out of ten, uh, so that's a pretty high score for me. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, the stories were solid, nothing fancy or anything, you know. And uh, the art was fine, just not. I don't love it as much as you. Uh, but I was. <laughs> that's fair. But I was impressed by the uh, like the satirical nature of it and the fact that this was totally not what I expected. I was like, oh, yeah. this is something much different than I expected. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, it had a lot to say and. Uh... Yeah, just an interesting world to live in. Yeah. All right, so there it is. Judge Dredd, issue two from 1983. Uh, I might check out more Judge Dredd. I might. I can see it. Yeah. All right, so next week on The Big Show, we're going to have our buddy Bob Myers come back on, you know? he was uh, He's been a regular over uh, the years here, and he filled in for you when you're off for a couple months there. Or yeah. a couple of months ago, you were, you were gone for what three or four weeks or something. But anyway, yeah, something. Like uh, so Bob's coming back, and because I'm a nice guy, you know, I'm not like this Mike L. You know, he would have guests come on, and then he'd tell them, "You're reading Batman, whether you like it or not." No, yeah. no, that's not. That's he would not like idea. the Jedi mind trick them into it yeah. somehow. Yeah, I let the guests pick the book usually, you know, unless there's uh, mm-hmm. something. So I say, "Hey, Bob, why don't you pick us something good? Pick us a winner, Bob. You know, like the old Natural there. Did you ever watch the Natural?" Uh, pick me a winner, Bobby. Sure. Yep. All right. So, uh, Bob, uh, I don't know if you picked a winner. Uh, Uh-oh. But, yeah, you're uh, warning me before the show that it might not uh, be a, be our finest hour. We're going to go uh, 1989, I believe, is the year this came out. Okay. Dino Riders, issue one. Dino Riders. <laughs> I've never heard of this. I think you know it was what company a company this is? It's Marvel. I think it's like a uh, toy line situation, one of them deals. You know? oh, wow. I think I think I remember those toys. I may have even had <laughs> one of them. Well, then you'll enjoy this. I think I remember the song from the commercial. <laughs> wow. It's all coming back. <laughs> it's all flooding back. Jake's wow. Mind. I had no idea there was a comic book. What was it yeah. number? Which issue were we doing? Uh, we're going to do number one. Right, uh, we're going to start at the top. So, Yeah. Dino Riders. Mirror-ish. So if you've ever wondered, hey, uh, what's it like to ride a dinosaur? Well, apparently this book's going to tell you. So, I mean, we already learned from Fallen Angels that you have to watch out for, like, <laughs> lobsters when you're riding on a dinosaur. <laughs> yeah, Fallen Angels. I forgot about that. All right, so that's next week here on The Big Show. Also, you know, uh, we're going to try and uh, make this show better, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> And the only way to do that is full frontal nudity. I don't know. But uh, here's what we want to do. If you actually listen to this show, which I find hard to believe, feel free to reach out to us. Because this show is available, you know, on the uh, Spotify's and uh, the Apples, I think. You can get it on the Apples. Uh, sure. All those places, you know. You can get you can get it. YouTube. And, uh, yeah, yeah, and it's also on the YouTubes. What we do on the YouTubes is we take this audio – and we just slap some pictures on it, and then we throw it up on YouTube. So if you want to see, like, the interior art and the covers and stuff, you can go find us on YouTube under Michael Dale's, the channel, under, that's my name, you know. And then, uh, or you just search for Flea Market Fantasy, you'll find it. But uh, yeah. what we want to do is uh, we want to interact with the listeners, you know. Mm-hmm. We want to engage with the audience, Jake. <laughs> for sure. Yeah, it sounds good. Now, our audience is mostly shut-ins, and they <laughs> they don't like interacting, and I appreciate that. But maybe if you, have a, if you have a book you want us to do, you know, or if you have some questions you'd like to ask, or if you'd just like to insult us, uh, feel free <laughs> yeah. to maybe leave, <laughs> leave a comment <laughs> on, you know, the, uh, the YouTube uh, page there or something, you know. Just say, hey, you guys stink. And just put a comment there, and uh, we'll talk about it or something, all right? So let's yeah, see how that works. We're not above reading hate mail. Because <laughs> I have a theory. 
and my theory is that no one listens to this show. It's uh, <laughs> we're just screaming into the well, back. Somehow of the space. we're getting views on YouTube, so somebody must. I'm be. guessing they're all just robots, you know? <laughs> yeah, just all bots. Yeah, they're all robots. They're all but Rowena's. If, if there's actually a human out there listening to this show, <laughs> maybe leave a comment. You know, that'd be something. But, uh, or if you're an AI li- bumping up the numbers, you know. Let us know when you're planning to take over the world so that yeah. we can be prepared. Yeah, and how about bumping up those numbers more than, like, 12? You know, can you really <laughs> yeah. check them up pretty high? Do we have to slip you a robot 20 or something? How do we make this happen? <laughs> that would make it uh, even better. All right, so that, next week, uh, Bob Myers will be here for Dino Riders Issue 1. And until then, don't get any jank on you.